Hello and welcome to Health Matters on Channels Television. Thanks for joining us. I am Mary Alale Yusuf. Most of us know when we hear itis, it's not good news. That's true of meningitis, a disease with a high case fatality rate and leaving survivors with serious long-term complications. The World Health Organization lists it as a major global public health challenge. Many organisms can cause meningitis, bacteria, viruses, fungi, and parasites. The bacterial variety is of particular concern. About one in 10 people who get this type of infection die, and one in five have severe complications. From October 1st until now, there have been 420 suspected cases, of which 43 have died. 334 of these cases were reported from Jigawa State. Safe, affordable vaccines are the most effective way to deliver long-lasting protection. My guest on the program is field epidemiologist and assistant director at Antimicrobial Resistance Program. She's also a manager at the Nigeria Center for Disease Control and Prevention, Dr. Abiodun Egwenu. You're welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. From the name of the disease, there's an inflammation somewhere. Can you explain this? So the meninges are the parts that cover the brain and um, they protect the brain uh, where it's encased in the skull. When meningitis is when this part is inflamed. So when it is inflamed, that means things can enter into the brain. You know, the brain is safe or kept from mixing with other, even blood doesn't get to the brain. So when the meninges are inflamed, that is what causes meningitis. And as you have rightly said, there are many things that can cause the meninges to be inflamed. But at the NCDC, the one we are particularly concerned about is the epidemic prone meningitis, which is caused by the bacteria called Neisseria meningitis. If someone has meningitis, what does the person complain of? What are the symptoms? So um, the symptoms of meningitis are non-specific. So it's usually fever, headache, malaise, fatigue, uh, maybe vomiting and diarrhea. One of the key features at the later stage is convulsions and the person could be in a coma. And as you have rightly said, it also cause deaths. In other words, if a person has meningitis, it could be mistaken for something else. Many other conditions present similarly. So, for example, malaria presents similar to meningitis, um, typhoid fever, other forms of infections that are bacterial, viral, fungal, parasitic, present in similar fashion. And that is why for any infection, it is essential that a blood test or a proper sample, in this case for meningitis, the cerebrospinal fluid is taken by a trained professional and blood to test for both the infection and any other infection that may be causing those symptoms. How is it contracted? How is it spread? So it's a respiratory illness. Uh, it's usually spread by droplets. And one of the factors that um, propagates its spread is when people stay in poorly ventilated areas or people sleep in close quarters without ensuring that they are, where they are staying is ventilated. One of the key things that prevents meningitis is vaccination. In Nigeria, we actually have the vaccine as at 2022. The post campaign um, coverage for children show that uh, the overall coverage rate for Nigeria is 50%. So the vaccine has been available for over 40 years. And for children especially, it is essential that they receive this as part of the routine immunization package, which is already made available through the national Primary Healthcare Development Agency. At what time in the life of a child is this vaccine given? How many times and, you know, when do they start? So usually the campaign starts um, around when the child is um, between one and a half years. And if there is any need to have um, repeated vaccinations, the MPHCD will provide this information. But every child, it is part of the um, package. In addition, there are other infections that are not Neisseria that also cause meningitis. And this is given three times. 
uh, at six weeks, 10 weeks and 14 weeks when the pentavalent vaccine is given. So this also protects the child against other bacteria that cause meningitis aside from mycelium meningitis. Okay, so you're preventing against different causes of meningitis. So exactly. So you're talking about the Neisseria. The Neisseria, yes. is that the most popular it's one? one. That's then the you have the menin meningitis or something like that? That's Neisseria meningitis. You have streptococcus hemophilus. Then you have uh, hemophilus influenza. So there are three main, and these ones are already in the, um, in the vaccination package for children. Okay, so after all this has been given at EPI stage, is there supposed to be some sort of follow-up vaccine or are they now covered completely? So the children are covered, but you know, for vaccination, we also have the way the body responds to each vaccine. And that is why during an outbreak, if the health authorities feel that a particular area needs to be vaccinated, then there's usually some additional vaccination, a booster dose, similar to what happened during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So this is what uh, is usually done. And in the case uh, of uh, Jigawa, what we noticed is that a lot of the children that have, uh, and a lot of people that were actually cases, very few were vaccinated against uh, um, the bacteria causing meningitis. So just to be clear, so that parents can hear, if their child has had uh, a meningitis vaccine, it doesn't cause any harm to have another if there is an outbreak. Yes. If there is a need for every child that the health worker interacts with, they would actually ask for, because for every vaccination, there's a card given. So when the card is reviewed, then they'll decide if the child needs a booster or not. So this is what is done every time. Is, is um, meningitis like some other vaccinable diseases where even though the child has had full cover, they can still get it? And how serious can it be if, they, if it is like those diseases? So um, for meningitis, um, the vaccination is important. And while the vaccination is still effective, there are antibodies in the blood. So that means even if the person wants to fall ill, the infection will not be as severe. But the most important thing is if anyone has fever or the person feels any symptoms that um, pretend some illness, a test needs to be done. And as, I, as you have also mentioned, even if we are protected against bacterial meningitis, there are other causes. So the best thing is to have a test done. Once the test is done, then the best way for treatment will be provided uh, to the particular individual. Let's talk about these other causes of, of meningitis, you know, the viral, the parasitic and others, not the bacterial. What do those look like? Are they self-limiting? Are they serious? So they still present in the same way uh, with the fever, the only thing is the therapy that we are given will be different. So for the infection to resolve, then a particular therapy depends on the agent provided. And this is something that is uh, based on the clinician's prognosis and uh, diagnostic capacity, um, clinician's diagnosis, laboratory testing, therapy, and also prognosticating the patient's condition. So they are varied. It's something that is parasitic and antiparasitic will be given if it is fungal and antifungal agent to be given, and they are various. So even for the meningitis infection, once the sample is taken, then it will be tested against an array of antibiotics, and then it will be decided the best course which antibiotic. And that is why the best place to receive your care uh, is in the hospital. Okay, let's even go to the hospital for a bit. You keep emphasizing about a blood test to make sure uh, of the exact type of uh, meningitis it is, and if indeed it is meningitis. So here's the thing. I want to ask, how much time does this disease actually give a person to react? How, how much leeway does it give before it becomes really serious or deadly, as the case may be? Then when the test is done, how soon does it come out? So usually uh, meningitis manifests within a few hours to a few days. So it depends on how it was contacted, the load of the infection, 
coming into the body. And once um, the blood test is done, the clinician or the health worker provides what we call empiric treatment. So there are some drugs that we know are effective. But the reason why the test is also done is to confirm and to also decide that this course of action that has been taken should continue. So for a person that has suspected meningitis, a blood sample is taken. And in addition, the cerebrospinal fluid from the spine, the fluid there is tapped. And this is now um, tested uh, against an array of antibiotics to determine the best antibiotic. But, it doesn't, but the patient is not left just like that, no. There will still be some care uh, and therapy given to the patient. But the antibiotics, as, as you mentioned earlier, I also need the antimicrobial resistance work at the NCBC. The reason why we want to test is to be sure that that antibiotic is the best choice for that patient, but we don't leave that person like that. The antibiotics are tested against the drug, the bug, and then once we now see, oh, this antibiotic is also effective, we continue. If it is not effective, then it is stopped, and then the new one instituted. But all, all the time the person is on care, uh, the person will be under the observation of the um, health worker. Okay, so you and waste no time in treatment. Um, some women have never attended antenatal classes. They don't go to the hospital. They have their children at home. So they don't have any sort of um, uh, immunization plan that they can follow. Can such people go to any primary health care center and be registered and register their children for the EPI, for the expanded program on immunization? Yes, all um, primary health care centers, secondary hospitals, and even um, tertiary hospitals have a section for vaccination. Once the child comes to the hospital and the parents say, I would like to vaccinate my child, they will be um, taken through the process and the child will receive the appropriate vaccination. And there are also catch-up uh, vaccines, vaccination for children. So, for example, if the child did not get the vaccine at the time he or she was supposed to get the immunization, the, um, this can also be discussed with the health worker and they will provide a plan for the child to have the vaccinations up to date as needed. Okay, so um, after a child has been vaccinated, and let's say that there's no eventful case, no outbreak or anything around the area, how long does the vaccine cover last? So for the meningitis campaigns, usually within two to three years, there's usually a call for uh, vaccination. So, so that if a place is epidemic prone, there will be enough what we call herd immunity. Uh, but the um, National Primary Health Care Agency, Development Agency, actually are in charge of that. And they will be in the best position to actually provide more information on how the campaigns work and how often uh, vaccinations. But two to three years, there's usually uh, the campaign for children that are in the vulnerable age group to have vaccinations. And especially if there's an outbreak in the particular area, then everyone that is at risk in that area is vaccinated so that enough people have received vaccinations to protect against these infections. Well, I'm actually asking, for example, if a, ch a vaccinated child can be immune from meningitis for a lifetime, 10 years, 20 years, and that is why I also mentioned that meningitis is caused by many organisms. What we have vaccinated against are the common ones. And that is what we are focusing on. So, and that is what is in the routine immunization because children are more vulnerable. So um, the, the meningitis can be caused by, so because someone has been vaccinated, doesn't mean that the person can't have meningitis from some other causes. And that is why a test should always be done. Okay. Can adults get a vaccination? Maybe they haven't had any all their lives and they just want to get one. Is it possible? Yes, adults can get uh, vaccinated. Once there's an outbreak in an area and the person is at risk, then they can also receive the vaccination. 
uh, once the vaccine, once the person is at risk of having an infection. Okay, thank you so much. We'll just take a short break. Stay right there. We'll be back in no time. Welcome back. This is Health Matters on Channels Television. We are talking about meningitis. By the way, we are in what we call is called the meningitis belt. I'm with Dr. Abiodun Egwenu. And you can call 0808-054-2233 if you have questions on meningitis. You can also tweet at CTV underscore Mary A or send me email at moalale at channelstv.com while we continue with the, uh, with the show. Dr. Egwenu, what are the complications of meningitis? So meningitis is an inflammation of the brain and um, the meninges of the brain. And if um, a person doesn't receive the appropriate treatment or um, in our um, area or in, the, in our clients, sometimes the person presents less, late. There can be disabilities that arise from meningitis. Uh, for example, some persons could have um, blindness because the brain controls every part of the body. Um, there could be some challenges with walking. It could be prolonged coma uh, affecting cognitive functions of the individual. And the worst complication of all, which is um, death, would result from um, having a meningitis. So it's a uh, detected um, all hands are on deck to ensure that the person recovers quickly and with um, no is it possible to recover without side effects if you can hear me dr Gwyn. i can hear you can you hear me yes sir. we can hear you well is it possible to recover without side effects Yes, it's possible to recover without side effects. Once the treatment is started on time and um, once the detection is, important, is, um, is, is on time. So and that is why for everyone out there, it is the key that every fever should not be treated just at home or just by going to a pharmacy close to the house. Any fever could be um, meningitis, especially since we are also in the season. Because meningitis also is a seasonal infection, it changes in humidity, wind, weather, the infection becomes intense. So anyone out there with a fever uh, should actually go for testing. And also the, most, the key to um, reducing the occurrence of meningitis is prevention. One of the key things with drugs on is vaccination, but also sleeping in well-ventilated areas, ensuring that our environment is clean, and then cough etiquette and hand hygiene. So when people cough, not just coughing on the floor or after coughing, you cough into um, your hand and then without washing. So it's better, it's, it's the cough etiquette says that you cough into something that is disposable, for example, a tissue, if it is in a handkerchief. So there, are, there are modifiable uh, behaviors to helping exactly. the disease. Exactly, exactly, to reducing the occurrence of disease. So, so and if you have, please go ahead. Go ahead, okay. Let's just say a child has had meningitis, he's been treated and has recovered. At what time can that child get a vaccine? Because this is a point of confusion with some people. They feel that if a child has had a disease, then he has immunity. But enlighten us on this. So if the child has had an infection and the um, vaccination, because as I mentioned, it depends on what is causing the infection. If the child has not had immunity to that particular bacteria, then the vaccine will be given. But what we usually focus on is the commonest, which I have mentioned. Uh, so and that is the meningococcal vaccination. That is the main A campaigns. That are, con that are conducted depending on the serotype that is prevailing. So even 
in the in for public health, we use the data to guide the vaccine. So even if the child has received vaccine against this particular virus, if we still notice that there are some other, I'm um, sorry, against this particular bacteria, if we still notice that there are other bacteria causing the infection, then we can we still advise that for people in this particular area, you need to have this additional vaccine as further protection. You also because spoke about the season of of uh, yes. meningitis. Yes. Right now, it's a bit hot. Weather is hot. But explain to us what is the, well, ideal season would sound like something good. But what is the season that meningitis is at the highest? So it's usually highest within the Hamatan dry season because that is when the droplets can fall uh, and then they are encased and people can pick it up. So it's usually during this period uh, where the hot and the weather and then um, um, that is when a lot of the cases occur. Over the years, this is the way it is. Let's quickly, sorry to interrupt you, let's quickly take this call from Odutola. Hello? Hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon. What's your question? Welcome to the show. Yes. I, I'm, I'm going to ask the doctor. In, 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 a, in a place where there's, where there's a poor facility, we can, uh, and if a patient has uh, this uh, meningitis, can that be uh, free? Hello? Thank you. We can hear you. We can hear you, Odutola. We can hear you. We can hear you, Odutola. It appears we've lost Odutola. And I don't exactly know what he's asking. But, Dr. Igwenu, yes. I think he's asking, first of all, what kind of facility? He's talking about a facility that is poor. And then he's talking about having treatment free. Maybe you can you can make something of that and enlighten us. So all facilities in Nigeria, uh, are, as I mentioned, when we're talking about vaccination, have the ability to provide vaccines. And um, laboratories, at least facilities that provide secondary and tertiary level of care. Um, once a person presents there, the, they will collect the correct um, samples and tests. Uh, similar to what is happening now in states where there are outbreaks and the NCDC has sent rapid response teams to the field. So there we um, have several pillars for, for a response, uh, which is one, surveillance, looking for cases, so actively searching for cases. The uh, second one is testing, and we leverage what is already existing in the state, so the secondary and tertiary facilities to collect um, samples, blood blood and cerebrospinal fluid. And then the third is managing cases, so providing them with um, therapy. Uh, this season is when a lot of cases um, occur because of the dry weather and also breakage in the respiratory, upper respiratory tract line. So the infection can then enter into um, the bloodstream through that. So we also support case management. Before now, because we already know from history that this is usually the time when we have a lot of cases. We have prepositioned countermeasure materials, which includes um, antibiotics and also personal protective equipment and laboratory consumables. So this is what NCDC has always been doing before the, um, because for a lot of the illnesses, they are seasonal. So before the season, this is prepositioned in states that already have a, a history of having this infection, and even in states that do not have a history, some is some of the materials are prepositioned so that once the state start noticing cases, they are able to swing into action. And also, we have the emergency operation center across all um, states um, now activated, so public health emergency operation center. Nationally, we have also activated our um, emergency operation center. And we are now supporting using this approach. Then in the public, we also conduct risk communication and public enlightenment, which we are, we are why that's why we're also on channels here, where we actually talk about how people can prevent infection. 
And in the hospital, we also train health workers and support them with infection prevention and control and interventions and measures. Thank you so much, Dr. Igwenu, for coming on the show. I was particularly happy to, to learn about the modifiable behavior uh, that can help the ventilation and that mothers shouldn't be afraid. Even if you didn't have your child in a hospital, go to a hospital for a checkup and know whether it's meningitis your child has. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you very much for having us. And thank you at home for watching us. Thank you for watching us on your TV, on your phone, on your computer. And thank you for calling in, Udutola. Have a wonderful day. I am Mary Alaleyusu.